from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 183, recorded on May 7th, 2020. Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. And how are you holding up? I'm very well, thank you. And from a remote location, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Hey, Daniel. Which is not a parking lot, right, Daniel? No, no. I've created this little area to record, and I have this wallpaper that make it, makes it look like I have a stone wall behind me. So I'm right. sort of ashamed that we can't, you know, we can't be on video here. You, I we, saw that the other day when you gave your Columbia talk, that little <clears throat> faux, faux stone wall. <laughs> Could you tell it was faux? You know, all it. of the uh, announcers on the NPR uh, evening news broadcast from their home, of course, and uh, every one of them has a different kind of bookshelf, and it's fun to try to read the sides of the books and see what they've been reading. <laughs> We can have next time we can have video. I'll use a different recorder and uh, we can do we can look at each other. I, would, I, I, I wouldn't do that because then not only would we <laughs> no, Dixon has very slow internet. <laughs> so if you tried to send video, you know, it would just That's right. The internet's as fast <laughs> as I am. All right. This is actually TWIP. This is which TWIP. Uh, means we have a case from before, Daniel, remind us what that was about. We we do. Um, so to remind everyone who is tuning back in and to uh, present this to folks that are tuning in for the first time, uh, last time on uh, TWIP 182, we discussed the case of a 60-year-old female who uh, came to see me in, in the clinic. This is uh, before we switched to virtual visits. And she came in with her husband. The husband was apologizing the whole time for you know wasting my time. Um, and uh, the woman told the story that she had grown up in Lima, Peru, which I enjoy because I've spent time there. Um, and uh, she relates that she was having an issue. Um, and she said, you know, I had this issue when I was a child. I would get this itchiness around my anus and my mother would have me eat uh, pumpkin seeds. Um, now I'm having this issue again. Every two to three weeks, I'm waking up with this severe itching in that same area. And uh, what she actually did is she took a Q-tip, she extracted something, and she actually has a video of this on her phone. Uh, just by the way, anyone who comes and sees me, I much prefer watching the video. You don't need to bring it in. Um, <laughs> she saw uh, she, she saw another physician, um, showed them the video. Uh, she had stool, ova, and parasites done. Uh, she had stool cultures. Everything was negative. They didn't know what was going on. Um, and then she actually um, came to see me. Um, I went through a bit of my review, right? She didn't have any past medical history, no past surgeries, no allergies. Uh, she wasn't taking any medications. Um, she actually has quite a bit of travel. Interesting enough, um, she and her husband mainly travel to and from Uganda. Again, an interesting connection um, where they do um, a lot of um, philanthropic type work there. She's HIV negative, no toxic habits. Um, husband says he's fine. Um, we mentioned that she does have children, grandchildren, um, which may or may not be relevant. Um, but yeah, she's got this small um, little thing that she extracted. Um, and I get to see a video of this little thing moving around on her video. So, All right. We got a bunch of guesses. Excellent. Dixon, can you take that first one? I would love to. Heather writes, I'm no expert. I'm just a high school assistant principal who used to teach English, but who has loved science my whole life. But that sounds like pinworms to me. Raw pumpkin seeds are a folk remedy for them. I think the sample she gave her uh, general practitioner must have been in a part of the life cycle where they didn't show up in the test. We'll come back to that. You guys have been great friends to keep me company during this time of isolation. I live alone, but I have subscribed to all of your This Week In podcasts, and every couple of days, it's as though you're having coffee at my table, and I'm listening in on the most fascinating conversations. Thank you so much for that. Be well. Stay well. Heather, what a That's nice thing. Wonderful. What? Wonderful. That's exactly what we envision these to be. Yeah. A conversation that people can drop in. Exactly on. right. Exactly right. And now, 12 years after we started, people are 
finally understand it. It takes an emergency to bring out the best in people, right? Mm. Daniel, can you take the next one? Anthony writes, I'm writing in once again to provide a possible diagnosis for the 60-year-old woman mentioned in TWIP 181. The anal itching, of course, brings to mind what is probably the most common roundworm parasite of humans, pinworms. Of course, however, they are extremely small and would probably not be video worthy and would not likely persist as a smoldering infection for so many years. This leads me to my possible explanation of what was seen on the video, a mobile segment of a tapeworm. Of course, it is indeed a flatworm foe. PZQ is the usual drug of choice. If I indeed do win a hard copy, I would like it shipped <laughs> to a lab rental service. <laughs> what, what is that word? Do it yourself. Do it yourself. Bio teaching facility in New York City called GenSpace. Oh. Even though it is only a BSL one facility, that does not mean that people do not work with closely non pathogenic organisms, and thus could be an interesting read for those wanting on a PCR hmm. run. Once waiting. again, thank you for all you do, Anthony. Yes, waiting. <laughs> interesting. Dear, dear. Self taught biochemical maniac. So. He's saying what was on the video was a tapeworm segment. That's interesting, Dixon, isn't it? Yes, it is. But it, uh, yes, we'll come back to that too. <laughs> okay. Wow. That means uh, Steve is next. Steve writes, hello, TWIP team. It's been quite a while since I replied to a case study. I got behind on episodes and couldn't keep up. <laughs> this one is pretty straightforward. Our 60-year-old woman from Lima has Enterobius vermicularis, also known as pinworm. The adult females tend to come out at night to lay worms on the anus. A side effect is intense itching. Scratching it can cause the eggs to get on the fingers, allowing for reinfection via the good old fecal oral route. Hmm. Uh. This is much more common in young children who constantly scratch their rears anyway <laughs> and aren't known for having even the poor hand hygiene habits most parents have. <laughs> This is great. This is also likely how she was infected. I suspect she has young grandchildren around who are infected themselves. Not surprised that stool culture in Ova and Peak came negative. I had to advise a nurse practitioner a while back on an adult patient that O&P exams often miss pinworms and that the best test is placing clear tape on the anus first thing in the morning after the pinworm has laid her eggs and then looking for the eggs under a microscope. We have sticky paddles that work even better, but we tend to send these to a reference lab now due to the fact that it's so rarely ordered. It can be difficult for our techs to retain competency at identifying pinworms. And even the pediatric physicians have stopped performing it as a PPMP here. Albendazole or mebendazole treatment will, like, will solve the problem, but even without medication, she would likely see the problem resolve in time so long as she doesn't reinfect herself. Might be worth having the grandkids examined as well. Thank you for all you do. Stay safe in this pandemic era. Steve in the Eastern Sierra. Right. I, sh I should probably uh, translate PPMP. The yeah, would you provider, please? Yeah, the <laughs> provider, provider performed microscopy procedure. Uh -huh. Yeah, I noticed there's there's all these like multi-letter acronyms that I think um, people quickly, um, you know, get used to and, and throw out there. And and I think I noticed them more because I move between so many different sort of um, vocabularies, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like the like the receptor binding domain, the RBD. <laughs> I was listening to the recent TWIV and quickly RBD was bantered around and I'm like, oh, receptor binding. I have to like translate for myself. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, so. I don't even bother anymore. <laughs> you just mix it all up. Well, I right, wait Dixon? for you. I wait for you because I know you know the answers. Dixon, can you <laughs> take the next Wright, one? Steer Twip Trifecta. Here I am, a blast from the surely forgotten past writing to you. I have been a loyal follower of Twip and Twiv for years, but life caught up with me and I have not been able to write in with a diagnosis for so very long. Now, however, that I am sheltered in in lower Manhattan, I have a few patches of extra time that were not previously available to me, so here I am. It is 61 degrees Fahrenheit, 16 degrees centigrade, and pouring today. I think that Dr. Griffin's patient has returned from her travels with a pinworm infection, enterobiasis, back from her travels to Kenya. Actually, it was Uganda, as I recall. She recalls quite vividly having the same nighttime anal itching that she now 
as a child had in Peru and mentions that her mother gave her pumpkin seeds to cure it. Pumpkin seeds are apparently a home remedy for several types of gastrointestinal worms. In addition to pinworm, they've been used in an attempt to get rid of tapeworms. There is some evidence that uh, curtabiasin, I didn't say that right, curtabiasin, a compound in pumpkin seeds, among other plants, bitter gourd also carries this compound, for instance, does help eradicate gastrointestinal worms, though tests on livestock have used pumpkin seed extract, which presumably is much more concentrated. That would be uh, that, than that, I'll try this again is much more concentrated than what could be obtained by eating normal human amounts of pumpkin seeds. But this may, uh, but, but maybe this is not just the case if the remedy worked for the patient as a child. Dr. Griffin didn't post the video that his patient <laughs> supplied, I suspect because it would give all of the evidence that we would need. Pinworms migrate at night to deposit eggs, so it's possible that the patient captured a pinworm in the act of wandering around. That evidence combined with the extreme anal itching makes that a likely diagnosis. The CDC, not endorsing the pumpkin seed cure, recommends babendazole, parental pamoid, or albendazole in two doses separated over two weeks. Thank you so much for giving non-scientists a chance to try our hands at guessing. Finally, I can't thank you all so much. I can't thank you all so much for everything you do. Uh, Dr. DePommier, you brought tears to my eyes as you talked about what a hero Dr. Griffin is. I would say it again, too. You are all heroes to me. I so appreciate everything you do, especially now that it is easy to feel lonely and without hope. I tune in to TWIP and, or TWIV and feel interested and galvanized and engaged. And in this moment, that means so very, very much. Huge thanks to all of you. Be well, be safe, and best, best wishes. Elsie in Lower Manhattan. Elise. Uh, Elise. Sorry, Elise. <laughs> My reading skills uh, have not so, been honed recently. <laughs> Elise, I remember you very well because you used to write in all the time. And in fact, from time to time, I wonder, hey. where is Elise? Okay. Here she is. She She's exists. safe. She's safe. Not forgotten, Elise. No. Daniel. Adil writes, Dear Doctors, it is currently a cloudy 42 degrees 6C in Cleveland. I hope you are doing relatively well in the midst of the current situation. One silver lining of which has been the ability to listen in a timely enough manner to start responding to cases again. My case guess is pinworm given the location of the discomfort. This was reinforced by the <laughs> finding that pumpkin seeds are a long-standing treatment for the parasite, though I cannot find credible evidence of efficacy. I also wanted to inform you that um, work I wrote regarding TB and soil-based helminth co-infection in South Africa was accepted by the pathologist as they start up their rear on infectious disease. Thank you both for the wonderful family of podcasts and for motivating me. I already have both a copy of Parasitic Diseases and Red Mother. So I hope <laughs> someone else could experience the joy I already have. My best as always. Great. Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. Yes. Look at that, MD candidate 2021. American Medical Student Association Global Health Leader also. That's very important. Is that right? Yeah. Well, Good if you man. say so, Dixon. Yep. If you say so, let's see. I got. I forgot to I, – I, I stopped numbering. I, <laughs> I think to go I'm back next. And put some, no, I'm, you're not next. I'm, I'm not next. next. Okay. No, Dixon, I am now. I'm keeping track, but I have okay. to put some numbers in. All right. Trudy writes – Dear Twippers, I may be fairly proficient in virology, but when it comes to parasitism, I really know <laughs> only one thing, pinworm. <laughs> Best regards, Trudy. I already own a copy of PD. Excellent. We know Trudy. She's Wait a minute. If she owns a copy of parasitic thing. diseases, she must know no, more than just one thing. No, I think she has kids, and that's why she knows um. it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Petrudy has been on Twiv, Dixon, but you wouldn't remember. I guess I wouldn't. I'm too old to remember things like that. Daniel, you're next. Oh, no, Dixon is Wait next. Wait a minute. Sorry. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. My apologies. That's My okay. Apologies. Adam writes, hello, fellow eukaryotes. <laughs> I'm writing in to Twip for the first time for the episode 182 case study. When I heard the anal itching, I immediately thought pinworm, aerobius vermicularis. That was further confirmed by the negative ONP and Q-tip results since anaerobius doesn't come out in stool. Clever. 
She probably picked it up from her grandchildren in the U.S. The travel to Uganda is a red herring. In fact, it seems pinworms may be less prevalent among Ugandan school children than among U.S. school children. I attached a 2001 article, Epidemiology of Intestinal Helmet Infections Among School Children in Southern Uganda, which reports 1.7% prevalence, 35 cases out of 2,004 2, children. Wow. Similar studies in California in the 80s found 7 to 43% prevalence among schools. I wonder if it's possible that pinworm prevalence is lower in Uganda due to competition from the number numerous other Hellman's listed, though I don't recall any of them specifically competing for resources in the anal plus perianal region. I also want to echo Dixon's praise for Daniel on the last episode. I'm amazed that you managed to get in another great episode of TWIP along with all the work you're doing on treating COVID patients and your interviews on TWIV. Best, Adam. Okay, Daniel. Josh writes, hi, TWIP hosts. I believe Dr. Griffin's patient has enterobiasis, commonly known as pinworm infection. What led me to this assumption is that she was suffering from pruritus ani or itching sensation around the anus occurring nocturnally, a characteristic symptom of anaerobius vermicularis infection, whereby the gravid females lay their eggs around the perianal area during the night, subsequently leading to the itchy sensations. Why this occurs nocturnally is believed to be triggered by the host's drop in body temperature during sleep. Another important clue was that her ONP stool and stool culture came back negative. This is likely due to how quickly the eggs hatch and the larvae may crawl back into the anus, retro infection. Therefore, in order to obtain the eggs or diagnosis, a clear adhesive tape should be applied to the perianal area in the early hours of the morning before a stool has been made. Finally, Dixon's emphasis on whether she had grandchildren also gave it away, <laughs> as this is a common infection among young children and institutionalized people, daycares. I believe the video is most likely going to be an extract <laughs> of a female adult female, 8 to 13 millimeters long, which is interesting is that her husband isn't complaining of the same symptoms, but the bedding is most likely harboring the infective eggs, can last up to two to three weeks on inanimate objects, or be inhaled as they can go airborne. I hope I'm right. P.S. <laughs> it's a sunny, windless 24C afternoon from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, yeah. Looking forward to more TWIP and TWIMS. I know this isn't TWIV, but here's a recent paper from Nature that sparked my interest and maybe yours. And it's entitled Dynamic Genome Evolution and Complex Viracell Metabolism of Globally Distributed Giant Viruses. Oh, this wow. paper left me wondering, could there be viruses that are inserting genes, beneficial or detrimental, into our potential offspring's genomes by targeting our germ cell precursors or cells of spermatogenesis or oogenesis? Mm. Kind regards, Josh Aaron, um, and he's a microbiology student. Nice. Very interesting paper. Hmm. We may have to do this on uh, TWIV. <laughs> Although, you know, <clears throat> viruses are parasites, right, Dixon? Absolutely. James writes, I'm going to guess that she had some grandkids or foster kids or kids in an orphanage she supports or something similar that also have itchy butts. The classic one would be pinworms and rubies vermicularis, very common in U.S. and elsewhere. Pumpkin seeds are a home remedy, but I could not find, quickly, since I'm in the midst of teaching microbiology to med students, anything up to date. I considered very briefly Schistosoma mansoni, which could get into the colon, but don't really know if it causes puritis anus, puritis ani. I did find a brief mention of a perianal rash with schisto. This might be sucking up a bit, but trichinosis can cause puritis. <laughs> and since I attended Duke Medical School, sucking up was a valuable survival skill. <laughs> Actually, um... The uh, hookworms suck up much nicer. Uh, not sure how I avoided pinworms with three daughters and four grandsons. Wow, I got Giardia from my oldest daughter, who got it at a Girl Scout camp in the mountains near Las Vegas, of all places. As always, what is the differential diagnosis? Roids, probably one. Ask any woman who has had delivered any babies vaginally. Fishers could do it. I found that some spicy food could do it. I ate some five-alarm eggplant dish in India when I was 18. I don't know if it was chemical or E. coli, but man, did I get the trots. And I had anodynia. Just made that word up, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Also looks like chronic wetness or post-antibiotics. Canada, 
almost a parasite, right? Yeah, Canada is a parasite. And it has a nucleus. That's true. So twip on and draw my number. <laughs> Jim. Mm. Hello, Twip. I'm Dan from Connecticut, quarantine at home due to Corona. I've listened to Twiv once in a while before, but I'm using the time now to work through the other podcasts. Thanks to the whole team for putting together such interesting content. My guest is Enterobius vermicularis, the human pinworm. This little bugger seems to match the description closely. And Dixon's question about Children, grandchildren supports this, and school-age children are those most affected. Treatment is two doses of the microtubule depolymerizing special mebendazole or albendazole or pyrantel pamoate, given two weeks apart. Anyways, I'm no doctor, but that's my guess. Thanks again, Twipsters. I've learned so much from the show. Cool. Okay, Daniel. Andrew, right? Andrew writes, Kia Ora from ah. Hongaroa. No book one yet. I'm hoping for a fluke. Shout out to Dixon, Twiv603. Weather, the Pangaroa drought has broken, and today there's a strong wind, clear skies, and temperature of 19C. COVID-19, today is the first day of the relaxation of our strict shelter-in-place measures. And apart from some businesses being able to start again, um, if they can provide contactless delivery, like pizzas live, um, mm -hmm. will be much the same as it has for the last five weeks. Everyone's staying within bubbles of households and or essential workers and avoiding other people and keeping two meter distance at any encounter. Our active case tally is 270 down from 929 and daily new cases are in the single digits, mostly Kiwis nursing returning home. Uh, testing and tracing have resulted in an R not estimated to be 0 0.5 or lower. Our prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, is keeping the country in strict isolation with only New Zealanders being able to enter. And she has a staged and gradual plan to return us to whatever the new normal will be like, hopefully a few weeks away. She has the strong support of 86% of the country, where we are rather proud. It should be. My guess, pinworm, enterobius, and then he says follicularis. I think he was joking. <laughs> <but> I, <laughs> I think Daniel is being tricky here, including a couple of red herrings to lead us off the track. The lady's age and the travel to Uganda can be seen as less important than the facts that our parasite can happily stay on the end of a Q-tip and that a video was taken means it was... Um, most probably motile. The only other parasite I can think of small enough to cause intense itching is Sarcoptes scabii, which would be too small to be easily noticed on the cotton bud. So unless she has a pet that has whipworm, the most likely vector are her grandchildren. Incidentally, I grow pumpkins, <laughs> and my neighbor constantly asks me to give her any spare pumpkin seeds to deworm her chickens. Another good <laughs> clue. <Arg. laughs> Kakit. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. See you again. Kakite ano. Kakite an. Okay. <laughs> Dixon. Yes, Samantha writes, Hello, TWIP hosts. I would normally be writing from the beaches of, I mean, the medical school library in Miami, but alas, I am writing from Nevada, where I am currently studying from home with my family. Thank you for all you do in terms of scientific communication during this time and all other times, too. My guest for this week's case is Enterobius vermicularis, also known as pinworm. The anal puritis and finding of the adult female during her nighttime migration down from the colon or rectus to the perianal skin to lay her eggs is indicative of this pesky worm. She likely picked up the eggs from her grandchildren, who may have had the infection, scratched their butts, then deposited the eggs on objects, people, and toys in the room, but by not washing their hands, as kids do or do not. I looked into pumpkin seeds, the seeds of cucurbitia, cucurbitia pepo, as an antihelmetic, and found that the seeds, flesh, leaves of the curatiba plant have long been used in traditional Native American medicine as antimicrobials to treat urinary incontinence and ever to lower blood pressure, low, low, lower blood glucose. Sorry, it <laughs> seems that much clinical research has been conducted to investigate various compounds derived from that plant, uh, or for a wide range of pharmacological interventions. Very cool. Nature provides. 
To treat this patient, prescribe 11 milligrams per kilo, max one gram, parental pamoate in a single dose, followed by a second dose two to three weeks later, or kill uh, later to kill any worms that had hatched from eggs ingested following the first treatment. I would also provide the same treatment for the child and anyone living with the child who has close contact. One final note, I think I must have been reading about pumpkin seeds too long because when I referenced anaerobious section of parasite diseases, the first thing I thought of when I saw the picture of anaerobious eggs was, wow, those just look like pumpkin seeds. <laughs> with their shells intact, they kind of have an egg-like morphology, maybe a crossover of an anaerobious and a trichurus egg, just giant. Cheers. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Our our last one. Right? <laughs> the last one. No, there's more, but this is this is Kevin. This is Kevin. In order in order to avoid coarser terminology, I will state, perhaps over delicately, that our patient has pruritus ani. I love definitions that leave the hearer completely unenlightened. It reminds me of old <laughs> Latin dictionaries that define sex acts with Greek instead of English. Yes. Uh, Our case reminds us that biology can be degrading. Nature in its infinite perversity afflicts some people with a type of intractable itching called neurodermatitis. Naturally, it targets the scrotum and vulva, a conspiracy involving dermatology, Sigmund Freud, and the demiurge. Our case also reminded me of a schoolyard jibe in the form of a query and response from the early 70s. It was directed at someone who is scratching his posterior, perhaps a patient similar to our TWIP 182 patient. (laughs) Question, are you going on a bus trip? Answer, no. Question, then why are you picking your seat? (laughs) It's no coincidence that the anatomic zone at the seat of our discussion was formerly referred to as the fundament. The psychic power of this lowly location has been used as a whipping boy by figures as disparate as Luther and Freud. I close these generalities with a quote by historian and legal scholar William E. N. Miller, quote, by virtue of this extended metaphorization, the anus is seen as the footing on which our dignity depends. It must be secured or everything else built upon it crumbles. <laughs> I don't think that pumpkin seeds are cutting it. More on those below. I strain to construct a differential. Here's one, perhaps an incidental infection with rat oxyruids. Hmm. Our patient is suffering from recurrent symptomatic enterobius vermicularis infection. Pinworms, PD7 dramatically phrases the worm's birthing style. Quote, she experiences a prolapse of the uterus, expels all her eggs, and then dies. Expulsion can be so intense that the eggs become airborne. Biology and life cycle are succinctly treated in PD-7. Other interesting facts from various reviews, very common uh, treatment repeated in 7 to 10 days due to unreliable egg killing. Whole family as well as sex partners need to be treated. Six-hour embryonation is the fastest, among the fastest of any nematode. Right. Ova can survive in the environment for one to three weeks. 30, 40% of patients may be asymptomatic. Wow. Not zoonotic. Humans are the sole host, no risk from pets. Stool O and P will be negative. Eggs are laid outside of the intestine. Eggs are not reliably found in stool specimen. Need to do the tape test. No visceral migration stage, as in Asker's complications, such as ectopic worm migration, are rare. Vulvovaginitis, female genital involvement possible. Appendicitis associations are debatable. Most reviews stress the psychological stress and misery caused by these infections. <laughs> Treatment recommendations in PD-7 importantly discuss some observed price disparities between various treatments. Manufacture of the old standby drug mebendazole has been discontinued, and prescription albendazole can cost 10 to 15 times more than an OTC pyrantel pomoy. Pumpkin seeds are as a vermifuge aren't as far-fetched as they sound. References and discussion in the end notes. Where can I see that video? <laughs> Griffin, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's on YouTube. Appreciate the whole TWIP group superhuman efforts during our pestilential era. What a nice word, pestilential era. Bunch of references here, uh, other complications, and then a little bit on pumpkin seeds and uh, what they could do. Drug pricing. PD7 would be authors congratulate on discussing the observed price of pinworm pharmaceuticals. This valuable information was not in any of the general 
Enterobius articles that I reviewed. $6.58 at CVS, a single, and then for a box of them, a single 200 mg tablet at gen, of generic albendazole, $42, non generic, $114. Absurd. Generic albendazole, as stated in PD7, more expensive by a factor of 10. Mibendazole is available in the U.S. only through compounding pharmacies. Uh, curcubita seeds, pumpkin seeds, Amazon, 200 seeds, $3.99. <laughs> when Cheryl, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. This is from Consumer Reports. Quote, when Cheryl Kennedy of Chicago went to fill a pinworm prescription for her four-year-old daughter, she was astounded to learn that four tablets of Albenza cost almost That's $700 absurd. even with insurance. It's crazy. It truly is. All right, a few terminal curiosities. Um, let's see. Canine angiostrongolus is a life-threatening disease of dogs caused by a very sophisticated worm. Who is this champagne-quaffing, tasseled, loafer-wearing, manicured, avocado toast, nibbling, vermiform creature? <laughs> Where did you? Uh, then he gives you a bunch of names for the tortured terminology of the butt crack, which I won't talk Please about. Don't. And one more. Uh, but you'll find them in the show notes, microbe.tv slash twiv. And uh, historically, and I personally suffered from pinworm infection uh, in a co-ed dormitory. Yes, they performed a tape test. Many people were infected. It was very memorable and di extremely distressing. The pests do cause insomnia. The health service provided a big single tablet of mebendazole. It worked. I wasn't reinfected. I've been eating pumpkin seeds ever since. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Daniel, that was great. Uh, Devlin writes, hey, TWIP team. I discovered Microbe TV a few weeks ago when I stumbled across upon a TWIB episode. Being a bored, quarantined high schooler with no job, little homework, and an interest in microbiology, I got hooked. I've been mostly keeping up with the latest microbe.tv stuff, but I've listened to a few older episodes that really interested me, and most notably, the twibs on Delta viruses and non-primer dependent DBDPs. I know I am a bit of a disadvantage here, um, competing against PhD students when all I have um, in a class of 2020 yard sign and no high school diploma, but I think I've got it. <laughs> the parasite is likely the pinworm. These parasites spread via the fecal-oral route, catching a ride on people's fingernails. Once digested, the pinworm hatches and develops. It lays its eggs in the rectum, causing itchiness. Beyond this, their disease is relatively asymptomatic, and they cannot be identified in stool samples. One way to identify them, though, is the eggs are visible under a microscope. I believe the Q-tip either got some of these eggs or an unlucky mother. I am not sure about the Uganda part, but I think my idea is worth a shot. One question I have is about past microbe.tv episodes. I was wondering if any scientists from my city, UW, Fred Hutch, or the college I attend, Colorado College, have gone on or what episodes those were. I've heard the host talk about Harmit Malik a few times, and I was actually able to interview him a few years ago for a school project about migrants. Another episode I would be curious to listen to is one about bacteria, phages, epidemiology. I know it's a very specific topic interest, but I feel like it would be something very interesting to listen to. Best wishes, and thanks for all the podcasts. Devlin. Cool. Yeah, we have had people from the Hutch, uh, Michael Ammerman and Harmit have been on. Not from Colorado College, but um, Devlin, you can Google that. You just Google TWIV and, you know, Michael Ammerman, you'll get it. You can do that since you've discovered these things. I'm sure you can do it. Hmm. All right. Um, Dixie, Cecilia writes, dear doctors, I will be brief because I'm sure you will get plenty of responses for this case study. I believe the 60-year-old female patient is infected with Enterobius vermicularis. According to PD-7, it is the most prevalent nematode infection. The patient's ova and parasite studies would be negative because the eggs are laid at night in the perianum by the gravid female when she migrates out of the anus. These eggs can be seen on a scotch tape prep or a pinworm paddle. The specimen must be collected early in the morning before the patient gets out of bed and goes to the bathroom. The patient was probably able to collect some of the worms inside the anus with a Q-tip. I hope you all remain safe. Sincerely, Cecilia. 
Last one, Skyler writes, good morning. I hope you continue to be well. No book last time, but at least my first ever guess was right. Thank you for clarifying about human versus canine scabies, since both diseases are called scabies, and vets always told me it was contagious. I just assumed it was the same mite. This served as a reminder that it is dangerous to assume. (laughs) Excellent conclusion. (laughs) My guess for the six-year-old female from Peru is pinworm. If something visible can be extracted from the anus, and it is neither a human inserted foreign object nor so-called rope worms sloughed off intestinal lining due to a consumption of a consumer activated bleach known as MMS, then it is most likely a worm. I found a paper looking at the toxicity of pumpkin seeds as they are apparently a folk remedy for stomach pain, inflammation, <laughs> fever, and, and most relevant worms. Intense perianal itching combined with negative stool samples suggest pinworm According to the CDC, pinworms exist worldwide, so I won't try to guess whether she got this from Uganda, Peru, or the good old USA. Tape test to confirm. Check the grandchildren. (laughs) Wishing you the best. Thank you again for this wonderful podcast and for all the work you continue to do. I pray for your safety and urge all listeners to stay home, even if they live in a state that has opened up unless mandated to work. Stay safe. And there you go. Got it. Wonderful. 14 guesses. Terrific. Actually, 15. Kevin already got a book, so I left right. him out. <laughs> All right. What's up, Daniel? Um, well, do we give away a book yes. now, right? Well, first, we uh, we hear your uh, resolution of this. Oh, you guys, you guys know what it is. <laughs> you know, we haven't got a clue. <laughs> you know, you know, see we, the video, we, damn we, it. <laughs> shall we? Shall we let you you guess first, Vincent? What What do you think? Yeah, I, I thought that since you had the itching and and pulled something out that wriggled, it must be a pinworm. But this guy with the tapeworm segment is very. It's very interesting, and I want one of you two parasitologists to address it. Yeah, Dixon, you sure. want to, like, why is it, why is that person not right? That person isn't right because, <laughs> A, it's gigantic. I mean, a segment of a tapeworm would be visible without a Q-tip or anything else, and they crawl out on their own, by the way, but there's no itching. Okay, there's no symptom associated with it, so it would be unlikely that that's what she found, mm. uh, why do the pinworms cause itching? Because of the uh, when they disintegrate after the female has a prolapse of her uterus, she re- she uh, gives off all of her body fluids to the perianal region, and repeated yeah. exposure to those proteins ex- ex- uh, elicits a, a you know, allergic response, which uh, is followed by itching, and uh, that sort of facilitates the reacquisition of the infection. So there's a biological uh, loop that might be closed with that. Got it. I wonder if there's a protease involved. Uh, in what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they have proteases, but I'm not sure that they use them to lay their eggs. No, I'm just making a I'm making a reference to our paper, Dixon, but you didn't I pick didn't. it up. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually, I think it's an important part of the biology. It's a selected, because of the itching, um, that actually helps with the life yeah. cycle, yeah. should this be That's pinworm, right. which, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, wow, we got it right. <laughs> <laughs> I think to, just about, just about. That was a tough one. It right. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it is interesting because, um, you know, the symptom, the story is very compelling. Um, th- this is really like, you know, when she comes in and, and the husband is apologizing, she tells me the story, you know, even down to the pumpkin seeds. I was, oh, this is great. And then, you know, she pulls out the video and these, um, the, f- the adult females are about a yeah, centimeter. They're I mean, they're, they're, they're so yeah, sure. they're visible to sure. the naked eye. So very easy to catch on a, um, on a iPhone, um, video. Right. And, um, you know, and it's actually good that she caught it on the video because I see a fair and, you know, pinworm is common. Um, but a lot of the labs have stopped doing um, the paddle right. testing. Um, and I'm not sure if it was a question of, as mentioned, you know, just keeping up personnel to do it. Um, um, people, you know, pinworm is now over the counter, the treatment, um, the worm X stuff. So um, that might be a part of it. So it's sort of nice to be able to really confirm that that's what it was. Many times I end up just um, recommending the over the counter treatment. Uh, but there is something really cool. I was thinking about this when I was, when we were reading through um, Kevin's, Kevin's uh, email here. And, you know, and, and I, I always talk about this wonderful, you know, yeah, all these, you know, 
I don't know, nature channels on how wonderful other animals are. You know, they don't yeah, show yeah, enough. Yeah. Uh, you know, par- parasites always vilify, right? The parasite is right. huge and it's a monster inside us. But, you know, I always like to point out that the Enerobius vermicularis female is is one of the most um, giving of all mothers <laughs> in nature, right? I mean, she lives in this just hor- horrible spot. Sure. You know, I'm, I'm not sure there's limited resources there from a um, from a worm point of view, but it's not the nicest place to live if you think about it. Um, <laughs> and then she she's tiny. And so when she wants to, you know, basically give her children uh, an opportunity, she's got to migrate. And for her, this is really far. I mean, these are these tiny little delicate females. So she's got to migrate all the way up and then she she doesn't just give birth. She actually goes to this act where she everts, she prolapses her uterus, and all these eggs fly out, and then and then she dies. You know, it's sort of um, it's just beautiful um, visual if you think about this. But one of the things that also I thought was really interesting is what size is a pinworm egg? And this is this is sixty you know, micrometers. Yeah, so it's about five microns. And mm. in the in the world of COVID nineteen, what is something magic? No, it's bigger what is than that. It's Daniel, Daniel, it's bigger than that. Those are the droplets that spread SARS CoV two. That's why these can become airborne because eh. these are right about you know fif- yeah these are right about you know so yeah no they're no they're a little bigger they are a little bigger, a little bigger. <laughs> they are they are ten times <laughs> they are too ten big. times too big so, that's right yeah so I so I will so I will say that they're not truly airborne right they're they're spewed several feet in the air but but yeah they're jet propelled uh but they're about 10 times bigger than they would need to be to be floating around in the atmosphere so they they only go about three feet or so but they do so you can say that but i'll tell you they did some studies a long time ago i remember when i was a technician at columbia they were interested in pinworm at that point because there was actually a drug for it it was called gentian violet pills and they used to give them to you uh three times a week uh and then uh you got rid of your pinworms, okay? But they did studies in the school right across the street from the lab, which is on 168th Street and Broadway. There's a grade school over there. So they went over there and they did uh, sampling. They sampled the floors, the windowsills, the uh, bookshelves, everything. And everywhere they found pinworm eggs. They were all over the place. So when kids come in uh to the grade schools and it's uh winter time and they have all these clothes on and they start taking them off it aerosolizes all of the things that are trapped in the cloth and everything else that's the way we hypothesize this at least and the air is literally filled with uh pinworm eggs so they they're light and airy and fluffy just like sort of like a little cloud that uh, drifts off into the environment and uh can be found quite a ways away from where they're actually uh ejected from and then they last they, they do last for they while. do they last like two two to that's three right weeks. so the the recommendation at that point was just to turn up the heat and dry them out because there was a saying at one time when they dry they die and uh in this case it, it <laughs> when they dry they true. die oh but they, they do no do these these eggs do actually do dry out and then they die that, that is true it is true when they dry, they die. That's a good title. <laughs> when they dry, they... Yeah, so this relates to treatment. So, yeah, people in the, I think, in the emails related to things. So, these, you know, this, these are microscopic. So, they're, you know, in the largest dimension, as Dixon points, about 55, 60 microns. Smallest dimension, say, about half or so. So, they, they do look like pumpkin seeds, but <laughs> microscopic pumpkin seeds. Um and yeah, basically, it's this auto infection cycle that you're seeing. So when someone comes in, um, you have to think about who is who is infected, and you you need to treat everyone who's infected. That will kill the females, but the eggs will still Correct. last. And then those eggs are then going to hatch, um, and then people can potentially get reinfected from eggs in the environment. So it's usually a retreatment, and then sometimes it's a second retreatment, and it's a retreatment of everyone. And of course, you, you, I, I made a point of mentioning in our book, you don't want to tell people, don't go spend 120 bucks on this, you know, expensive, you know, overpriced um use the parental palmoe which is just a few dollars sure. treatment you can buy like a nice big jug um or a small little thing depending on how many people in your family are infected but yeah it's treatment initially 
it's retreatment. And in some cases, we do another um, three week later right. treatment. Um, and what you're trying to do is you want to treat before that next generation of female about six weeks, right? Before she's going to be big enough and um, putting out her own eggs into the the environment. So, Daniel, didn't you find it a little unusual for an adult female to be harboring pinworm? Well, that was, I think you gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about, you, you mentioned the grandchildren. Um, yeah, and that's, that's usually what you see. Usually there's, a, usually there's a child involved, a grandchild involved. And I thought it was interesting, the red herring concept of Uganda. <laughs> right. I, I think it, mm-hmm. you know, I think that the pinworm incidence is correctly low in these areas. Part of it might be the fact that they tend to have a lot of deworming um, mm-hmm. campaigns. That and, you know, if you get dewormed every, the other thing may just be the issue is, you know, this may just not be something they care to report as much. So a reporting issue as well. But yeah, you don't need to travel. You can just stay here in the good old USA yeah. and we have plenty of pinworm for you. Sure. Every, but the uh, it's not unheard of in adults. It's not unheard right? of, but it's, it, it's it's less common. Well, but it's yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. I you know I yeah no I mean no the classic teaching Dixon is echoing is that classic teaching is this was a childhood disease. Um, I I see a fair I usually see like you know an adult every month or two. So it is less common in adults, but yeah we see it. Okay. This repro- this reproductive strategy is interesting. That the, the female dies immediately after expelling the eggs. You know, it just goes to show that once you reproduce, that's it. You don't yeah. you're not need it anymore. Uh, you know what else does that? Right? The female octopus. Yeah, when is she lays right? her eggs inside the cave that she finds under the water, and she sticks all the eggs in there. As soon as they hatch, she dies. How how old do they? Become? Uh, it's about these, these four or five people. years old before they achieve uh, reproductive I age. I think. Some of the some of the big ones, like the giant octopus in the Pacific Northwest, uh, lives a longer time. But the female dies. The female okay, we, dies. We have a um, now. In what cases do males die after Every, meeting? all the Black time? Widows, right? I, that's what I used to say to the class. I said uh, uh, when the when mating occurs in the small intestine, let's say for hookworm or for ascaris or for trichinella, the female goes on to mm-hmm. reproduce, and the male passes out, just like us. Interesting. And but nobody Dixon laughed. Black nobody Widow, laughed at that. But that, yeah, because that's a horribly out of date right. joke. You know what? Yes, I'm. I am horribly <laughs> out of date. So that's the way it Dixon, goes. Dixon, don't don't the Black Widow male get eaten after? Not, not if they're careful. Reproduction. They have to be very. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Tyrant- <laughs> Never mind. Why why ask Dixon questions? He's not serious. Spiders. No, no, spiders <laughs> have this habit of eating their mates, and you're right. Uh, I've seen a lot of nature shows recently. I saw one about tarantulas, and tarantulas, the females can sometimes eat the males also. So, All right, I'm going to generate a random number between 1 and 14 to see who gets this book. The number is 11. Right. Let's see who's right. 11. That is Samantha cool. from Nevada. Right. Winner. Okay, Samantha, send me your, your address. Uh, Twip at microbe.tv will get it out when the pandemic's over. Right. <laughs> because I have, I've got a backlog and I just can't get to them oh, because well, the pandemic, I'm brother. doing a lot of podcasting and other things, but I think it's good. Okay. We have an interesting paper here. And Dixon, I hope you read it. This is the structure and protected. Yeah. Yeah. The hidden uh, antigens. It's a fantastic paper, actually. I was really quite enthralled with it. Um, it's good structural biology, and it makes a, a very interesting point, and that is that this is an enzyme complex which has a configuration to it which can't be um, cloned and then expressed as individual molecules. These have to all come as a, a package uh, in order. Should we should sure. we read the should we read the title? Let's, yeah, let's yeah, let yeah, our yeah. listeners. So. So the article, it's a research article in PLOS right. Pathogens, I must say one of my favorite journals, um, and it's um, entitled Structure of the Protective Nematode Protease Complex, H-GAL-GP, and it's conservation across roundworm right. parasites. And the H stands for Humongous yeah. Contortus, which is a sheep parasite related to hookworm. All right. What does the GAL stand for? Um, it's a opposite of GAI. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and this this uh, first offer 
first author is <laughs> Charlotte A. Scarf, uh, last author, Stephen P. Mench. Yes. Um, so we've got Rebecca Tom- Thompson, we've got George Newlands, Alexander H. Jamson, Christopher Kenaway, Vivian J. DeSalva, yep, Alita M. Rabello, and Chung Fang Song, John Trinick, and W. David Smith. Where are they from? Leeds. England. Yeah, there's a bunch of folks here from from Leeds, so a bunch of folks from the UK. Um, We've also got Scotland, um, the Morindun Research Institute in Scotland. Um, We've got uh, Molecular Biology, that's University of Leeds, more UK folks. Uh, But we've also got some people from Brazil. Hmm. And do you want to do you want to read the Instituto de Ciencias (laughs) Biológicas? Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, Belo Horizonte, Minas Gerais, Brazil. I don't know if that's pronounced close. correctly. You're close, close. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we actually have um, the lab the, from uh, Hebei Medical University in uh, China. Right. And the reason why this is got a lot some background here to just get an introspective, Humongous contortus is a major pathogen of sheep and causes huge economic uh, losses in their herds. It's a blood-sucking parasite. It lives in the small, it lives in the stomach, the true stomach, the abomosum, which is the true stomach. There are three chambers to the stomachs of uh, ruminants, but this lives in the the, uh, middle uh, one, I believe, which is the abomosum. And it's, it's, it's becoming resistant to anti-helmetics. And uh, I didn't, Go and unfortunately read the um, references to that. And I'm not sure if they're becoming resistant to ivermectin or to some of the other more commonly used antihemetics. But these people think that what's really needed is a vaccine and a vaccine uh, which covers um, the gambit of, of all of the strongel parasites that infect um, basically economically important cattle uh, and uh, sheep, um cows, of course, goats, uh, all of those animals catch this infection. And they have a lot of other kinds of infections, which are similar to uh, to homonchus. Uh, Ostratasia is one of those. that uh, I like that parasite because you never forget the name. If you can remember the first Ostratasia, it's mm-hmm. called Ostratasia, Ostratasia. <laughs> so, um, and they all contain this complex of this galactoside, uh, galactose, right? Or, I believe that's galactose, right? And uh, there's, yeah. there's a glycoprotein associated with it, but it's a complex. It's not just a, a single protein. It's a, a, a number of proteins put together. So so cryo-EM was the only way to actually see what this structure looked like. And they selected it with um, uh, a lectin. And... Uh, they selected it with they a did. lectin. Good. They did. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I even learned there's a new lectin. I never knew there was a jackfruit lectin, but there is. And um, it's it's it was very interesting to see their progression because uh, the cloned antigens for these, or the cloned proteins rather, were totally ineffective when they gave them as a vaccine, a vaccine candidate. Mm. But with a complex together, isolated on the comp on the lectin, and then just injected into the sheep uh, gave a very high level of protection. So they think that this has application not just to sheep, but also to perhaps even to humans. They mentioned Ancelostoma caninum and Ancelostoma, uh, let's see, I blocked on the other one. Uh, well, there's obviously Ancelostoma duodenal. now. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that all of those parasites have similar complexes, which they use to digest hemoglobin. That's their main food. But it's interesting because they also mentioned that Ascaris sum has a similar complex. And Ascaris sum lives in the small intestine of pigs, and it doesn't eat or suck blood at all. It's, it's, it's not hematophagous. It eats what you eat, and yet it has this complex. So it must have a more generalized uh, function in other parasites. But it's been kept throughout evolution as a very useful protein to uh, or a series of proteins to to apply to their own biology. So this group thinks it's a prime target for um, vaccine development. So this is a protease, yes. essentially, that's digesting that's correct. nutrients, that's correct. right? And the interesting thing, it's Right, it's on the bound. microvilli right. of the small intestine, exactly. So the stuff is coming in, it's digesting into small bits, and those are passing into the that's cell right. in some that's way, right? right? 
And this is a large it's complex, very large. isn't it? Yeah, it? It almost looks like um, the remnant of a gigantic mm. shark. <laughs> you know, you're looking in the mouth of the shark, and you can almost see the teeth on either side of it. Um, <clears throat> but of course, it's not. It says here, this this structure provides the first evidence for how worms can efficiently tether the enzymes required for host meal <sighs> degradation without triggering a host right. immune response. Yeah, because it's not soluble. It's, right? it's uh, membrane bound. Interesting. Yeah, although many proteases, of course, are soluble. Yeah, but we have some in our intestinal tract that are membrane bound, though, don't we? Well, I'll tell you, Dixon, to make it really make relevant, it relevant, there's a protein called dipeptidyl peptidase, uh -huh. which is a surface protease uh -huh. in the intestine and other places. It happens to be the receptor for MERS Get coronavirus. Out. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> Small world. <laughs> What's the receptor for SARS-CoV-2? It's an ACE2. The, um, AT2, angiotensin-2. Angiotensin-converting enzyme, another enzyme, a membrane-bound enzyme, which is substrate is angiotensin, right? Very interesting that these viruses have have uh, migrated to, to membrane-bound enzymes. It's a little it's odd, odd, isn't yes, it? Because they should be digested, but they're not, obviously. So there may be a virus of... Humongous, sure and if so, maybe some of them bound, bind to this uh, digestive com complex. Who knows? Maybe the virus helps to get uncoated <laughs> by it. What sorts of miracles are Sorry. possible? Huh. Anyway, the protease joke I made earlier is. is still relevant. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so it's okay. But I thought it was I thought it was interesting here because what you know this is sort of feeding into what people are starting to talk about this concept here about this you know unified hidden antigen yeah, vaccine right. they they that's want to right. basically make a pan strongolid roundworm Correct. vaccine and the interesting thing is they're saying is a lot of um, we'll say pathogens have um, evolved. Uh, strategies or have evolved in such a way that there is not an effective immune right. response. Yeah. Um, so what you need to figure out, you know, what they're suggesting here through this approach is you can figure out a way to target a mm -hmm. hidden um, antigen, and then that potentially is going to help right. you. So, Daniel, did you just make a little joke when you said feeds into? <laughs> <laughs> I try it, to try. <laughs> it, it reminds me of the same um, philosophy that the people trying to develop a, a vaccine, a universal vaccine for influenza. They're not looking at the uh, the uh, sialic acid or the uh, hemagglutinin uh, antigens anymore, right? They're looking at some structural protein that they all share in common. Or, or often they're looking at down at the stalk, yeah, yeah, like a hidden right. part of the that's right. stalk. That's right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So, all right, yes. Dixon, very interesting. Do you have a, a hero? F I'm not a hero. No, I have a yes, hero. Yes, a hero. I do have a hero. a hero. Now, last week, last time got? we talked, I picked um, our fellow uh, Twiver, a Twipper, um, Daniel, obviously. And you still are my hero, by the way, I must tell you. But there was another hero that has emerged in the popular domain of uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic, and that's Tony Fauci. And he... He gets my vote for Hero of the Year. In fact, uh, the way he is able to with, with, withstand the uh, onslaught of ignorance and with a straight face try to make sense out of what has just been said but place it in context with, with what is correct and to see him twist and turn and still come out ahead uh, just is an un unbelievable uh, dance, okay, between, um, well, I won't even go there, but, but I'm just saying that Tony Fauci has emerged as the nation's hero. I mean, he's been imitated on Saturday Night Live. There are tons of YouTube songs about him now. He's an American, not a folk hero. He's, uh, he's the best there is of science uh, and the public. And I think he does a great job of communicating science. And I, I think that uh, we've had him on our uh, TWIV show, right? He was on TWIV 300, as I recall. He was on TWIV 219. I'm sorry, 219. But close. Three, 300 was uh, – Is that um, – 
I don't. I think we did that one at ASM. Four hundred right, was Harold right, Varmus. Right, right. That's what you're thinking. It must have been. Um, well, we can go back and look it up. But it, it, Tony Fauci still is uh, the person who, if he says it's okay to go back outside, I'll do it. Otherwise, I'm going to stay put until okay. it's safe. I agree. He's a hero, and I, you know, he was born and right, raised in Brooklyn, Brooklyn. and his his parents owned Fauci <laughs> Pharmacy. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> His father was a Columbia University f- trained pharmacist. Oh, he yeah. went to uh, Holy Cross. Then he went to Cornell University Medical College. Finished first really? in his class. Wow. He has served under every yes. president since Ronald Reagan. He says uh, in he one, has been head of, uh, one of NIAID, his interviews yeah. uh, recently, he says that he he no longer jogs, but he likes to do power walks with his wife at night. When nobody's looking, <laughs> because he he wants to keep a safe distance from everybody, so he goes out at night when everybody's back home. Yeah, it's a great pick, Dixon. Very good. Yeah, I was gonna. I'll, I'll throw in a personal connection with Please. Fauci. So, um, my mother. I don't know if people know this about my history, but um, when I was in high school, uh, we actually lived in the West Village during the early '80s, during sort of the early days before you know the virus that caused uh, HIV and AIDS was identified. And uh, you know, we lived down in these various like art artist co ops. Actually, my mother's a painter. And um, when it hit our community, when HIV, the virus hit our community in Greenwich Village, uh, there was a group of activists, our our neighbors, who um, got Mm -hmm. together. Um, They formed a group. Um, Anthony Fauci was part of this group. Um, and my mother was part of this group. Um, so it's always entertaining to see my mother when, you know, she sees uh, Anthony on TV. He's done so well. And, <laughs> He's a good boy. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I have to say, like, he he, he got a lot of I, I think um, I think he's doing so well because he developed some pretty thick skin during the 80s yeah, when he right. was that right. that, right. that right. pill, that pill pushing guy. Right. Um but no, he he has done he a has. tremendous amount, um, and he's been doing a tremendous amount for plus, decades, and he's still doing. Plus, he's a stuff. lab scientist. I mean, he was involved in the lab for years before he became the director of the uh, NIAID. Uh, so he knows what it's like to get a false positive and a false negative, and results that you don't trust, and all kinds of other. I mean, he suffered through the whole um, uh, episode of trying to create a vaccine for HIV, which failed miserably, but uh, he still keeps on the facts are the facts. You stick to the facts, you won't go wrong. And that's that's all he keeps saying, and he's absolutely correct. And Vincent, you keep preaching that also. I think that, uh, you know, if I had to pick you as a hero, I would say that you are, because you believe in the science. Science is um, non-committal. It doesn't own the facts, it just reveals them. And you have to deal with those facts. And there are lots of people out there that are not willing to do that. And they're going to die from this because they're following the wrong advice. And uh, it's very sad to see how um, laissez-faire most of the governors of the states that are most affected by the economy of having to uh, distance yourself and to remain indoors. It's amazing how willing they are to sacrifice people's lives to get their own government back into function. And it's very sad to see that. And Fauci is, he didn't say it's okay. As soon as he does, that's when I'm going to go outside. I just got a notification that mo- uh, over half of the U.S. states that are reopening don't meet That's White correct. House guidelines. That is correct. <laughs> and, and the White House has actually backed off of a lot of what they were saying, too, because they realize that it's politically – it's committing suicide, basically, because uh, five months from now, when all this hits the fan, so to speak, during the election, it's, it's going to resurface, and they're going to be held accountable. And uh, hell, I want Tony Fauci as the president. Come on, let's, let's put him up. <laughs> All right, my, uh, Daniel. Let's have a new yes. case study. Oh, yes, please, please, please. Please. Another story. COVID. This is a. This is a. This, this is a case of a seventy-year-old male without COVID. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so this is a. This is this is a two-part one. So first, we're going to talk about the the husband, and then we're going to talk about the wife. Um, so this is a 70 year old male who returns with his wife from a safari to Kruger National Park in South Africa. 
Um, he reports uh, that he's been suffering from, or he had two weeks of watery diarrhea. Um, you know, this is one of those things you pay a lot of money, you head to South Africa, they're going to have this wonderful safari experience. But when they arrive in South Africa, there's a severe water, water, water. Okay, I did also grow up in the New York area. This is a severe water, severe water shortage. I usually am careful with not having my accent come out, but yes, water yes, shortage. Very, very <laughs> As born in Queens, but even <laughs> and even though it was supposed to be this fancy trip, there was limited water for washing. Um, and they actually were having to use hand sanitizer uh, to clean their hands. So there was an issue with the hand hygiene. And after um, about five days after they arrived, both he and his wife um, start to become ill with diarrhea. Now, his diarrhea, um, as described, watery, and now it's been about two weeks. It's persisting. He's having about a dozen um, of these watering stools per day. He feels nauseated, has abdominal cramping. Um, you know, he was given Imodium and Azithromycin for his, quote unquote, potential traveler's diarrhea. No effect. Um, he, uh, he had a stool culture. Um, he had an ova and parasite exam done. Uh, these came back negative. Uh, just to give everyone a little more information, uh, he's a healthy guy other than this. No past medical history, no surgical history, not allergic to anything. Nothing runs in the family. Except diarrhea. Okay. <laughs> Except diarrhea running him and his wife. Um, but now he has his stool sent off. Um, but the ONP this time, it's requested that it be done with acid fast staining. And he has one of these stool GI PCR tests ordered. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, I'm not going to tell you what they show, <laughs> but this prompts treatment with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for seven days with following resolution of his diarrhea. Hmm. What, are the, what are the drugs again? Tell me. It is um, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, which is commonly known as septra or Bactrim. Hmm. And I feel like this is a, tr this is a treat um, for our, uh, how should I spell <laughs> this? <laughs> so that's uh, S-U-L-F-A-M-E-T-H-O-X-A-Z-O-L-E. -E. Um, I feel like this is a little bit of a treat for our regular listeners. I feel like you're going to yes. get this right. Um and so uh, <laughs> a little, that'll be my one hint for you. I make me proud. No, no HIV AIDS, right? So no HIV AIDS. And um, do, do they, they have no Wait, kids. What happened the kids to the wife? Gone, right? They're out of the house. She had we're going to oh, okay. talk about her oh, next, oh, oh, next, next time. Oh, next time. I see. Yeah. Just... But we're next time. Two, so this is, uh, yeah, this will be part one. And when you fig when you figure out what this individual has, then we're going to talk about um, <laughs> what happens to the the woman. Daniel, I have some questions here. Yes, ask. So ahead. he's there for five days. What is he doing in those five days? He's he's going on on these these jeeps and looking at animals, right? A exactly. I I don't know if how many of our listeners have had um, the opportunity to go on a safari, um, but most of the safaris are done as you describe it, Vincent, where you, you get in a vehicle, usually you get right. up when it's still dark and you go out. And um, so some of the best times, Dixon, you've been on several safaris. And so um, some of the best times to view the wildlife are early in the morning right. as the sun is rising um, and also then in the evening. And um, some people actually will go out for nighttime safari drives, but usually you take a break in the middle of the day. So um, in a place like Kruger, usually they're doing um, this kind of a thing. And that's what this gentleman and his wife are doing with right. their their group in this um, this tour. Um, but yeah, but then they're coming back and there isn't much in the way of, um, of water. So they're um, trying as best as they can to hand sanitize with the alcohol-based cleaner. Now, well, they're eating in this, whatever, it's a hotel or something? Uh, yeah, it's a lodge. Um, so they're eating there, and the the place is cooking yeah. food for them, right? Now, now, Dixon, have you been? To I was at Savvy Sands itself, this actually, is right? Of an upscale okay. of side. It, it's part of Kruger. There's no question about it. But it's a uh, it's it's like a little um, dead end uh, <laughs> that you'd see at the end of a community. Uh, all the animals go there, and everything else, and it's very very upscale, I would say, and. Um, very pricey, and as a result, we could only afford to stay there for four days. But it was the most riveting four days of both my wife's and I's lives. I mean, we saw things that you could never expect to see. For instance, uh, we saw a, 
a pride of lions chomping away on a um, Cape buffalo. And we could get within uh, 20 feet of these animals without disturbing them. And you could hear the bones crushing so in the, the jaws is- of the animals. In fact, I received an email from Vincent so- while I was there, and I sent him back a picture of that. I said, you better be nice to Dixon, otherwise this will happen mm-hmm. to you. <laughs> The, uh, so the point is the food the is, food is, is and, and good. everything was fantastic at this place, but there are some bare bones places that are not so great too, I think. All right. Yeah, so but no, this was a nicer, fancier type venue. Yeah. But what are they drinking for water? Any, do they have bottled water or something? So yeah, that's um, pretty standard. They're drinking um, bottled water. They're, you know, sodas, other beverages, yes. things like that. There we go. I'm good. Absolutely. You good, D- Dixon? All right. All right. That's TWIP 183. Microbe.tv slash TWIP is where you will find the uh, show notes. What is a show note? It's where we put links and, and letters and exactly. all the stuff we talk about. Questions and comments, case guesses, TWIP at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, pleasure as always. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. It was Thank fantastic. You, this was a wonderful exercise. This was one of our best, I would say. Had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racanelli. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on TWIP is by Ronald Jenkins, and I want to thank ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP it is Parasitic. Parasitic. <laughs>